Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for our Bible study once again today. Thank you for your word, the word of life. Thank you for the encouragement you always give us as we come together. We are praying, O Lord, that you implant your word in every heart today in Jesus' name. We pray we'll draw strength, encouragement, joy out of your word today in Jesus' name. We pray that whatever any brother or sister may be going through, you help every one of us to look unto Jesus and to go to the Lord because he'll carry the heavy burden in every heart, in every life, in Jesus' name. Support your people. Lift them up. Encourage everyone. Help us, Lord, to keep on standing steadfast in all the happenings of life in Jesus' name. That on the final day, everything you permit in our lives will work your work of perfection. And we'll see you on the other side of the road. In Jesus' name, we pray. Last week, by the grace of God, we started the study of a new book. And it's uh, the Epistle General of James. We have uh, looked at the introduction in chapter 1, verse 1. Today we're looking at verses 2, 3, and 4. Let's read together. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Those are the verses the Lord is leading us today into, and He wants us to study. You'll find in verse 2, he talks about temptation. And really there he's talking about trial. Because if you join that with verse 3, you see it says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So then as you look at this text, you'll find that the temptations are synonymous or the same with the trying of your faith. Actually the word temptation has a double meaning in the Bible. One, it means what we all know, enticement to do evil or solicitation to commit sin. But on the other hand, it also means, number two now, outward trials or troubles or testings to prove how genuine our salvation, our Christian experience is. The temptation in our text, in our passage today, actually means the tests that we go through that should produce testimonies in our lives, the trials that shall end up a triumph, the trouble that shall draw us closer to the Lord, the persecution that the Word of God has told us we're going to go through. There are tests that reveal how genuine some metals are, especially gold or diamond. And these tests and trials that we go through in life, they are to reveal how real our faith is, how genuine our salvation is, and how steady our fellowship with the Lord really is. If uh, you look at life, your own life and the lives of others around you, and the lives of people in Bible days, you'll find that life is full of trials and troubles, temptations and difficulties. We live in a troubled world. In fact, we're told in Job chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, it describes the world in which we're living unto us. See what it says upon your Bible, Job chapter 5, 6 and 7. It says, although affliction cometh not forth of the dust, neither does trouble spring out of the ground. Yet man is born unto trouble, as parts fly upward. It says when you strike a, so, a stone on another stone, or something hard like iron rod on concrete, you'll see how the sparks of fire, how they come up. It says as that happens every time you strike something, and somebody is striking something somewhere in the world, it says sparks are coming up and troubles are coming up as well. In Job chapter 14 verse 1, Job 14 verse 1, man is born of, that is born of a woman, is of a few days and full of trouble. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 tells us that this is the common experience of man in general. 
remember that these are just experiences of human beings in general, whether Christian or non-Christians, because of the nature of the world in which we are living. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 22. For what has man of all his labor, and of the vexation of his heart, and wherein he has labored under the sun, for all his days are sorrows, and his travail grief. You will see what the Bible is saying. It's simply telling us that uh, wherever you are living and whatever uh, you have uh, as experience, that there is trouble in the world. I read to you from the Old Testament, what does Jesus Christ himself tell the believers in the New Testament? In John chapter 16, verse 33. John 16, 33. These things have I spoken unto you, Jesus was telling the disciples, that in me ye might have peace, in the world ye shall have tribulation. That's talking of trouble. It's talking of some trials that will come our way. But he says, be of good cheer. Why? Because I have overcome the world. As you look at the Bible then, you find that trials do come. Troubles do come. Persecutions do come. What are these things really? Trial is something that breaks or disturbs the pattern of rest and tranquility. Trials, disappointments, hardships, suffering, sorrow, or adverse circumstances, they come to test and they come to try our faith. These trials, actually, they cannot destroy the real believer. Although they will destroy false, superficial faith, if a person is not really believing in the Lord, if he is superficially attached to the Lord, if he is not really embracing the Lord, when the trials come, what do you find? He falls off. But if you are a real child of God, these trials will only do one thing, purify your faith. Develop your faith and make you stand firm. Therefore, perseverance in our trials or perseverance through our trials will be the proof that the salvation is genuine and that you have living faith. But there's nothing to fear. If you're a real child of God, because we know we are kept, number one, because of the promise and the power of the Father. The Father has already promised us, when you go through the fire, it will not burn you. And when you go through the waters, it will not drown you. We have the promise and the power of the Father. Number two, we have the prayer of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He said he will, that the Father should keep us in this evil world and even preserve us from the evil. And then number three, we have the presence of the Holy Ghost within he is the spirit of truth. Although there will be trouble in the world, temptations in the world, trials in the world, yet he abides within us. He is a comforter. He is the one that strengthens us. He is the one that gives us the joy of the Holy Ghost or the joy in the Holy Spirit. And that joy is the strength of our lives whenever we are going through trials and tribulations. Our trials actually do some things in our lives. Number one, the trials strengthen our faith. If you have believed on the Lord, have you seen believers who are persecuted? The persecution, the trouble that they go through, actually, number one, strengthens their faith. Number two, it leads us to fervent prayer. And when you go through a persecution, you pray more than you have prayed before. It does something positive, something good in our lives. Number three, it proves our love for God. We can easily say, I love God. Embrace everything the Lord has sent my way. But when those trials come, when those persecutions come, and you're still standing in the Lord, what he proved that you really love the Lord. Number four, it produces greater commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been committed to him before. Then the devil thinks he's going to make us deny the Lord. The troubles come, the trials come. And then we say, Lord, you went through much more than this for me. What can I not go through for you? And that trial actually produces greater commitment in our lives. Number five, it perfects whatever may be lacking in our character. That's why as we look at it today, that James, the uh, writer of this epistle, is telling us, he said, when trials come, uh, there is nothing to murmur about. In fact, he tells us, we receive it with joy. He says, my brethren, those who are partakers of the grace of God, count it all joy. When ye fall into diverse temptations, try 
trials, tribulations, or trouble or persecution. Why? Because there's something you ought to know. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith work at patience, and there is something above that, and that patience can have a perfect work until you are perfect and entire, lacking nothing, deficient in nothing. We're going to divide our study into three parts. Number one, proper perception of tests and trials. Proper perception of tests and trials. Number two, purpose and patience in our trials. That is, the purpose of our trials and patience in our trials. Number three, path to perfection through triumph in trials. The path to perfection through triumph in our trials. I pray that every one of us will be triumphant in Jesus' name. Let's go back to number two and see the proper perception. How do you view your trial? How do you look at your test? Understand, your trials are supposed to produce triumph. And your tests are supposed to produce testimony in your life. Actually, when you look at a trial, when you look at your test, it depends on whose side you are. Because as God on the one hand, all he wants is that the test in your life will eventually end up in testimony. And all he wants is that the trial in your life will eventually lead unto triumph. But on the other hand, there is Satan. And what he wants, what he is expecting, is that the test will lead to discouragement, will lead to complaining, will lead to falling, will lead to backsliding, and then going away from the Lord. But the will of the Lord will be done. There will be testimony in your life. There will be triumph in your life. All that the devil is expecting will not be fulfilled in any of our lives in Jesus' name. Come back to James chapter 1 verse 2. My brethren, children of God, those who are partakers of the heavenly calling and the high calling, those who are the children of God washed by the blood of the Lamb. You remember now, these people were scattered abroad because he tells us in verse 1, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. They've lost accommodation, they lost their conveniences, and the persecution scattered them all abroad, and they didn't have the conveniences they used to have at home. They didn't have it in that place. That's why he's starting with, he says, I know what you are going through. I know what the dispersion actually means. I know the deprivations and the persecution and the trouble and the trial you are going through. But thank God you are brethren. Because the persecution and the trouble and the trial has not been able to cut the cord between you and the Lord. You are still the children of God. Now what are we going to say about your trial? He said, brethren, count it all joy. When ye fall into diverse temptation. I've already cleared it for you that the word temptation here means trial. If it's the normal, ordinary temptation, he will not say count it joy. There is nothing joyful when you are being tempted to commit sin. If he's talking about solicitation to evil or enticement to commit sin, there is no joy in that. In fact, you know, he will not tell you to endure that one. He will tell you to resist. You resist temptation. If it is temptation to sin, if it's temptation to do evil, that one you resist. But in this case now he's talking about temptation in the sense of trial. That's why he says, look at verse 12. Uh, James chapter 1 verse 12. Blessed is the man that endures temptation. And not temptation to evil. You don't endure that one. That one you resist. He endures the trial. He endures the test. He goes through the trouble because when he's tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Now verse 2, brethren, my brethren, count it all joy. Don't be sorrowful. Don't murmur. Don't complain. Don't wonder, why is this happening to me? Don't question God foolishly. Don't abuse God. Don't blaspheme the name of the Lord. Don't say anything negative. Don't take any negative action. In fact, be joyful in your life. Count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. That is, into various trials. And he tells us it's necessary. That we will understand the troubles we are talking about, they are not the troubles you make for yourself. They are not the troubles that are caused by sin. They are not the troubles that are caused by some kind of carelessness. This is just persecution, manifold, various trials. These things, they come from different directions. 
From where do they come, number one? They come from the devil. There are some things that the devil will cause. You remember that Paul the Apostle was writing to the Thessalonians. He said, we would have been there with you once and again. But Satan hindered us. Therefore, we know some of the trials, some of the troubles, they come directly from the devil. Number two, they come from the evil system of the world. Because of the nature of the world in which we are living, the world is evil. The world is a world of darkness. And the people of the world, they are following after their master, the devil. Therefore, they will cause some trouble for children of God. Number three, because of human corruption, because of the sinfulness and the depravity of men. But why does God allow some of these things in our lives? And why are we going to count it all joy? You understand? As a good soldier, it's tested. On the battlefield and not in the barracks. So our strength, our sincerity is tested in the battle of life. That's why these things are allowed. And then the word of God says, when it happens, be joyful. Are you going through persecution? Let there be joy in your heart. Don't let the devil see you that you are murmuring and you are complaining. You are wondering why is this happening. Let the devil see that you are a real believer and that that trial or that persecution will not kill your joy. And if you are joyful, you will soon overcome that sin and the victory will be recorded against your name in heaven in Jesus' name. In First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 6, it says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, do now for a season, if need be, ye, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now ye uh, see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. You'll see that the passage is talking about temptation. It's talking about trial. It's talking about a manifold difficulties. A heavy body. He even calls it heaviness in verse 6. Manifold temptation trials in verse 6. But then he's saying that there is one attitude we ought to manifest. There is one attitude we ought to show. In all those trials, he says, there must be joy. There must be joy. And then he mentions that joy uh, in uh, verse uh, 6. It says, wherein ye greatly rejoice. And then he continues, as you look at uh, the, the verses following, verses 7 and 8, he's still talking about the joy that we're going to be joyful, even though those things may be happening unto us. There's something we're learning in all this. When you are persecuted, don't count that as strange. When there is a little trouble, don't say, why is this happening to me? You know the devil will say, maybe you are not a child of God anymore. No, you are still a child of God. Do you remember Joseph? He passed through some difficulties too. Do you remember David? He passed through some of those trials too. Do you remember... Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, He passed through those difficulties to you. Difficulties do not show that you are not a child of God. If you stand in that difficulty, if you stand in that problem, you are still a child of God, and the grace of God will see you through. In First Peter chapter 4, First Peter chapter 4, verse 12, Beloved, you are still a beloved child of God, even though there is trial, even though there is trouble, even though there is persecution, Beloved, think it not strange, concerning the furry trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Are you experiencing some difficulty in your family? Is it that the in-laws are waging war against your Christian faith? Is it in the place of work that they say you ought to have, you have not got it, and it is because of your faith? They are persecuting you, and they are saying, we are going to see what will become of your faith. Don't give up, the Lord is on your side. What are you to do? You are to rejoice in verse 13, but rejoice. In as much as ye are partakers 
of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, that ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. That uh, when the Lord shall uh, appear, that all of us who have gone through the persecution, who have gone through the trial and everything, and the name calling and the abuse and the insult, if we keep on with the Lord, you'll appear with the Lord on that final day in Jesus' name. You see, the tests that I've told you, the only tests and proof are faithfulness and truthfulness in our profession to our doctrinal belief. You say, yes, I believe this doctrine. I believe this doctrine. And because of that doctrine you believe, maybe it's restitution. Maybe it's another thing. Maybe it's in your Christian conviction or your Christian dressing. Because of that, now they persecute you. If you didn't really have conviction, when that persecution comes and they turn the fire on, you are going to say, I, don't, I didn't know that this is the way it will end up. I didn't know that this is what they'll be doing because of what I said I believe. I think I have to change my conviction. There you are. It shows, as you see what the test has done, the test has come to prove that you didn't really believe what you said you believed. But if you really believed it, that test will prove that you are truthful, that you are steadfast, that you are faithful. I pray the Lord will keep every one of us faithful in Jesus' name. You see, your own faith in God is proved when you clinch unto Him under temptations and trials. There are many things that may not prove that we love God so much. The doctrinal knowledge in the head, the church affiliation, or even Christian activities, or even church responsibilities. But you see this, when you hold fast to the Lord in hard times, in difficult times, when it is difficult to make ends meet, and yet you will not bribe, and yet you will not follow the corruption of the world, and they are telling you, it is this your fanatical kind of standing, I will not give bribe, I will not, that's what is killing you. If you will change a little, and bend the rule a little, and change your conviction, you will, you will get what you want. If you keep on standing in this at time, the Lord himself, he will prove faithful to you in Jesus' name. You see, loving the Lord is the key to enduring in all our trials. That's why it says, count it all joy. Don't say it is strange. Don't say, why is this happening to me? Count it all joy. In fact, this is what Jesus Christ himself, this is what he taught when he was on earth. Look at the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, from verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. Not because of backsliding. You are persecuted. Not because you put uh, somebody's daughter in a family way. You uh, make uh, somebody's daughter pregnant. That one is suffering for your sin. Not because you stole and then they caught you. And now you are in trouble. Not that. But you are a child of God. You are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. He said you are blessed. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye. When men shall revile you. That means they will abuse you. They will insult you. They will call you names and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for the sake of the Lord for my sake rejoice and be exceeding glad you see the same teaching James said it but Jesus had said it much earlier he said rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you in Luke chapter 6 Jesus said the same thing Luke chapter 6 uh, in verse 23, Luke 6, verse 22, verse 23, Blessed are ye, when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Because you are now a child of God, you will not entertain them with beer. You will not give them the secrets you used to give them. You will not uh, give them their expectation. Because of that now, they will reproach you. They will cast out your name. They say you are not in their club anymore. You are not in their society anymore. And they will speak in derogatory manners against you. Look at verse 23. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. But you see, I know some Christians, uh, they don't suffer persecution, and everybody is speaking well of them. You see, 
can I know their secret? How is it that uh, they live their Christian life and they seem to be alright in the church and they're alright in the world and nobody persecutes them? Are you envying them? Don't envy them at all. Look at verse 26. Woe unto you. When all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers or the false prophets. Jesus said, if you see somebody that everybody is speaking well of and they don't persecute them at all and there is no trouble and there is no trial at all and there is no persecution uh, you should doubt that person's experience in them it is like they are compromised see they don't have any conviction but it says we must rejoice rejoice in your trial why because the trials are not meant to make you weak or weaker they are meant to make you stronger the christian is like an athlete the heavier the course of training he undergoes, the more he is glad because he knows that it is fitting him all the better for victory and for rewards. While we bravely bear the bodies that we must bear, there should be joy in the Lord. Joy in spite of the body. Joy in spite of the persecution. Joy in spite of the trial. With an overwhelming sense of fellowship with Christ who carries the heavier load, the heavier part of the body. We go to number two now, and that is the purpose and patience in our trials. Everything that happens to a believer actually has a purpose. Let's come back to James chapter 1, verse 3. Knowing this, if you didn't know this before, know it today. If you have been kind of at sea, confused, blank, and you do not know, why am I going through this? The Lord is in heaven. He knows everything. He knows my life. And He knows that I'm following the Lord. I'm a real child of God. Why will the Lord allow this kind of thing in my life? He said, you need knowledge. Knowing this, what are you to know? That the trying, the trial, the testing of your faith worketh patience. It means then that uh, although there is trial, there is a divine purpose that the Lord himself wants to accomplish. The patience referred to here actually means perseverance. What does that mean? Either you call it patience or you call it perseverance. It means that there is a quality in our lives that the Lord wants to mature, that the Lord wants to develop. And that quality is the ability to be able to abide firm and steadfast in the Lord under pressure. The Lord knows our nature. He knows that ordinarily, even after we are born again, even after we have been sanctified, even after we have got our Christian experiences, there is something that experiences of life will help us to develop. That's why he allows those trials to come upon us so that you'll be able to calmly wait upon the Lord as the Lord is going to unfold his divine will and plan. You're saying, I know the Lord is taking me somewhere. I know the Lord is uh, going to achieve something in my life. I know the Lord wants me to climb a particular mountain. He sees at this time, I do not have the strength, I do not have the power, the energy, the skill to climb that mountain. He is using this trial, he is using this test to be able to develop something in me. I am calmly waiting for the outcome, for the divine will and plan. I know he is up to something, I know he wants to do something, that's why I will be waiting. That's the patience that thing will develop in your life. It will develop yeah, the calmness in thought. You'll be thinking calmly. Although there's storm on the surface, internally, inwardly, there'll be calmness. He will develop resignation in temper. That is in your temper, in your inward disposition, the patience is trying to develop in you is to be resigned in your temper in the hands of the Lord. It also makes you prayerful in spirit. You are prayerful. You are leaning upon the Lord. It's like you close your eyes and you say, Lord, I will not see the storm. I will not see the wind blowing. I will not see the circumstances. I close my eyes to everything. I'm leaning upon you completely. It means that you are submitting to the Lord. And you are steady in your faith and your trust in the Lord. That's what he's saying. That when you have these trials and you are rejoicing in them. And you are saying, I know God has a purpose in this. There is nothing that happens to a child of God accidentally. And whatever purpose the Lord has, I know He is going to fulfill. That's why you are calm in temper. That's why you are patient in your spirit. 
That's why you are residing in your life. And that's why you are submissive to the Lord and you are studying your faith and your trust in the Lord. In Romans chapter 5, it tells us the same thing, which is telling us that uh, some people have felt that what James wrote about, that maybe he was uh, just a lone ranger. But you have said that the word he said is supported by what Jesus Christ had earlier said. And now we're looking at Romans, and you will find that the same thing is saying, Paul the apostle to you had said the same thing, Romans chapter 5 verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Please understand, this is not the great tribulation, which is for the world after the church is gone. It's called, this is the normal trouble. This is the normal trial. These are the tests of life. We glory in tribulations, trials, and troubles, difficulties also. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. You see that? It worketh patience. You see, without that in your life, you will be impatient. And you will not be able to calmly wait and calmly see the unfolding, the unveiling, the revealing of the plan and the purpose of God in your life. In verse 4, and patience works experience. And then experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. In uh, Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, uh, reading from chapter 1. And reading from verse 4. Here we are being told that uh, this sin has a purpose. And let the Lord fulfill that purpose. The purpose of patience and strengthening of our faith. Uh, look at verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in the, in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecution and tribulations that ye endure. You see that? They are tribulations, they are persecutions, they endured them, but what did it work in them? Patience and faith. They kept on looking at the Lord, and they kept on waiting for the Lord. They said, we know the heat will not be hotter than the Lord wants it. We know the Lord wants to melt out something in our lives. And we know that when that thing is melted out, the fire will stop. There is a purpose in this. There is an aim. There is a goal in this. And God is in control of everything. You understand? That whether it is trial or trouble or persecution, the Lord is in control. He will not allow that thing to burn hotter than it ought to. It will not destroy you. It will only purify you. In Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, Chapter 8, verses uh, 2 and 3. Still talking about the purpose of these trials and uh, the patience it works in us. They tell me chapter 8, verse 2. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God has led thee those forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove and to prove thee. That is to humble you and to prove you. That means to test you and find out what's in you and to know what was in thine heart. Whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. Here Moses was telling the children of Israel, you see the way the Lord has taken you through, you know why? You see the food he has given you to eat, you know why? You know sometimes why there was no water in the wilderness, you know why? You know sometimes why there were needs in the wilderness, you know why? The Lord wanted to humble you. He wanted to prove you. He wanted to know that whether you will follow him, uh, bread or no bread, manna or no manna, water or no water, provision or no provision. He wanted to know whether you loved him above all those things. Verse 3, and he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and they fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord does no man live. He said there was a purpose for it, and as there was a purpose for it, there is still a purpose today. Whatever the Lord does, there is a good purpose. Uh, never misunderstand when those trials come. And if you are patient, and if you are waiting upon the Lord, and if you are leaning upon Him, believing in Him, trusting in Him, eventually you will see that it's a good purpose. There is an important, interesting verse in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 11 and verse 12. Deuteronomy 32, verse 11. And as an eagle stirreth up her nest, 
uh, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth, uh, uh, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, and beareth them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. Maybe you don't understand those uh, two verses I've read. It's talking something about the way the mother eagle will train the young eagles uh, to be able to fly and to soar to great heights. They will be in the nest as soon as uh, they are born, as soon as they come into the world. But then, if they remain in that nest, uh, there will not be any way to develop the strength of their wings. Therefore, the mother eagle will come into the nest and stir the nest, and then break open the nest, and then one of the eagle, young eagles will be falling. As he's falling, he'll try to fly. And before the uh, young eagle will strike the rock and lose his life, the mother eagle will go under and spread the net and then spread the wings and then the young eagle will be there. He'll carry it back to the nest again. The next day will do that again. He will do that again. You know why? Because that mother eagle will be teaching that young eagle how to fly. And here is the illustration that the Lord was using. He said, so the Lord has done for you. All that he permitted in your life, all that he did in your life, it is so that you will be able to endure, you'll be able to go stronger. And if you have looked at your life, all the things you have gone through, what have they done? They have strengthened you. What have they done? They have made you to rely on the Lord more. What have they done? They have proved that you really love the Lord above the mundane things of the world. What have they done? They have made, they have proved to the people of the world that you are not serving God because of bread and butter. You really love the Lord. You know that you are more steady now You are more steadfast now You are more dependable now Because of the things that you have gone through And all those things we have gone through The Lord will even reward us for them When we get to Him in eternity In Second Corinthians chapter 4 Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 16 For which sake we faint not For which cause we faint not But though our outward man perish Yet the inward man is renewed day by day Although it may appear that the, the trials are affecting us in the physical And they are affecting us in the, in the outward external area But inwardly it's strengthening us day by day In verse 17 for our light affliction You see all that Paul the apostle went through He could have called them our heavy trial Our great problems because, you know, Paul the Apostle really had difficulty, but he said, it's only light affliction. What a day after all, when you compare them with the glories in heaven. What a day after all, when you compare them with what David went through, what Joseph went through, what Daniel went through, what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went through. What a day after all, when you compare what we're going through now, with what Jeremiah went through. What a day after all, when you compare them with what Jesus went through, and when you compare them with our mansions on high. You you compare them with the eternal rewards. They are nothing. That's why it says they are just our light affliction, which is but for a moment. It's like for a minute. When you compare the time we spend on earth and you compare that with eternity, it says it's for a moment and it worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. It says because of that, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, they will soon pass away, but the things which are not seen are uh, eternal. We pray that the Lord will strengthen us. And there is something he wants us to learn. As this thing is developing, uh, is developing patience in us. When you pray and you say, God, do this for me. He wants you to think of another word. With that word, pray, is the word stay. You pray and you stay. And when you combine those two words in your life, you'll know that the trials, the tribulations, the troubles, the difficulties, the hard time, is producing some good quality in your life. We come to point number three now. The path to perfection through triumph in trials. A trials have come. And instead of uh, making us fall, we're still standing. The trials have come. And instead of making us deny the Lord, we're still clinging to the Lord and embracing the Lord. The trials have come. And instead of making us to uh, say, well, I don't want to follow the Lord anymore, we're even stronger in our convictions today. It is leading us in the path of perfection as we are being tried, as we are being tested. In James chapter 1 verse 4, it says, but let patience have a perfect work. 
let patience, that is, that patience has been developed in your life, let it move on until it develops something which is in your life a perfect, having a perfect word, that ye may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing, wanting nothing. That is, the aim of testing is to purge us of all impurity. The effect of the testing, if we rightly bear it, will be to strengthen us. It will be to give us strength to remain steadfast in the path of perfection and to conquer in harder battles. You know what? If uh, something comes to you today and uh, you conquer, it prepares you. It gives you wisdom. It gives you understanding. It gives you the know-how that if something harder, something greater comes tomorrow from the experience of yesterday, from the victory of yesterday, you are able to overcome the one of tomorrow. But if you have never passed any test, if you have never gone through any trial, anyone that comes will just uh, make you to fall flat uh, on your face. But when you are overcoming and overcoming, it prepares you for something still greater. In a first uh, Peter chapter 5, verse 10. For the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory uh, by Christ Jesus, after that he has suffered for a while, just for a moment of time, you suffered for a while, make you perfect and establish and strengthen and settle you. You see that and there's little persecution now, there's little suffering now, there's little testing or trial now, and after you suffer just a while, just a moment, and then it will make you, it will make you perfect. See the testimony of the psalmist. That's in Psalm one one nine. Psalm one. 1, 9, verses 67 and 68. It said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. It said, I actually was going down the road. I actually was uh, di disintegrating or I was decaying. I was going back in my, in my Christian life, in my believer's life. In, I was degenerating actually. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now after that affliction, now after that trial, now after that test, now I have kept thy word. Thou art good and doest good. Teach me uh, thy statutes. He says, really, I realize now, before that trial came to my life, before that persecution came to my life, I actually was going down, going down, going down. And then all of a sudden the trial came, and then I woke up, I realized something was happening, and now I'm back on the right road again. It says that trial, that affliction has done something good in my life. Uh, look at uh, Psalm 138. Psalm 138. You see what we have read in um, what we have read in uh, James chapter one, verse four. It says that it will make us perfect. That is number one. What does that mean? It means that you will become mature. You will become fully grown. That means the trials, if we rightly bear them, will prepare us and make us fit for the task He has sent us into the world to do. And then it tells us another thing. It will make you entire. What does that mean? Entire. It means complete. It means that when you have unswerving, unwavering constancy in trial, and you are still depending upon the Lord, it will remove weakness, it will remove the imperfections in our character, and the power of God will work in our lives until finally we become entirely fit for the service of God and our fellow man. It uses another another word say in that James chapter one verse four. It says, "Wanting nothing." That means lacking nothing. It means actually you'll be deficient in nothing. When those trials come, they meet you in Christ. And while they are there, you are still in Christ. And while eventually everything is over, you are still in Christ. Actually, you become stronger. You are more perfect now. And patience is developed in your life. More faith is developed in your life. And actually now it gets you to a point where you are complete, entire, and deficient in nothing. Day by day. As you meet the adverse circumstances, day by day, as you face those hard times, then by the, by the grace of God in your life, the steadfastness is developed, you are able to live victoriously, and then you are made conformable to the standard of Christ, the standard He has set for us. In Psalm 138, verses 7 and 8, it says, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, 
thou wilt revive me. You see that? The trouble is not to, it's not to destroy your Christian life. You don't have a wrong attitude. The trouble, the trial, it should bring revival to your life. It should make you pray more. It should make you to look unto Jesus more. It says, thou shalt stretch forth thy hand against the wrath of mine enemies. If the enemies want to go too far, if they want to go beyond the limit the Lord has said, and the thing is not developing you anymore, and the thing is going to destroy you, the Lord will rise up immediately. He will stretch forth his hand against those enemies. The right hand of the Lord will save you. Look at verse 8. This is beautiful. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Do you believe that? Nothing will happen in your life. You will be led unto perfection. And that is what the Lord is looking for. Are you going through trouble? Are you going through a trial? Is there difficulty in your life? Why are you crying? Why are you acting as if there is no hope anymore? As if I'm going to backslide. If you don't see me next time, you know that what happened is that too much trouble came in my life. Never. You are going to be perfected in Jesus' name. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endure it forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hand. Why don't you tell the Lord tonight and say, Lord, now I understand. All the trials I've gone through, all the persecutions I've gone through, there is a purpose. You want to develop patience in me. You want to even make me perfect. And you want through those trials to make me the kind of person I want to be. Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, I know I'm, I'm not going to be this destroyed. Persecution will not destroy me. Difficulty will not destroy me. Hard time will not destroy me. Joblessness will not destroy me. All these difficulties, the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. He will perfect that which concerns you. He will perfect that which concerns you. Pray more in your trial. Lean more upon God in your trial. Believe more in God in your trial. Trust Him more in your trial. Don't let the trial make you negative. Remain with the Lord. Be positive and rejoice in the Lord. The joy of the Lord will be your strength. Be joyful. Be happy. God is dealing with you like a child. Don't let the devil confuse you that you are not a child of God because of tribulation, trial, persecution. If you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, praise the Lord, I'm a child of God. The trouble will just perfect you. The difficulty will just perfect you. Thank the Lord, praise the Lord, rejoice in the Lord. He will perfect everything concerning you.